Thank you, President Estrello, members of the community, faculty and staff, administrators, all the wonderful people who came out tonight. Um, tonight, we just wanted to give you a short synopsis of uh, the district's overview from a couple of different vantage points. Uh, we have roughly about 18 slides, and then that will lead us into uh, our budget presentation. So to start off our district overview, we wanted to say and talk a little bit about where we are. And as we've been talking over uh, several board meetings, presentations, one of our biggest emphasis this year is on curriculum development, and last year it's going to be so for the next couple of years. Uh, especially in the area of ELA and music departments are in the second year of their curriculum development cycle, and they're looking at the full implementation starting with the fall of 2019. There's been a soft rollout of it, but with the full implementation pretty much pre k through nine would initiate come this coming September. Uh, one of the other curriculum developments was in the area of health, especially around the maturation unit. Uh, as I'm learning in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, that maturation unit is about, as we say, uh, sex ed is what I've been told today. Uh, and I have a child in fourth grade, so I'm looking forward to that because that's being uh, implemented starting this spring. So uh, they've been working very hard on that. And then also, as we really focus on the ELA being the, the foundation of everything in our learning program, math is starting its first year of its cycle for curriculum development, and the implementation for full implementation is really set for the fall of 2020. Uh, that's going to take a little bit because they have to go through some uh, discussions on how they deal with curriculum, how they develop it, and then really looking at the vertical and horizontal implementation of the curriculum that is teacher generated and teacher developed to meet the standards of New York. Where are we? Obviously, we talked several times about the district wide capital project that continues. We'll have a little bit on that later, but that is one of the driving forces that's going on and eating up a bulk of individuals' time in the district with the hope at the end of having a very strong education program with the facilities that ultimately match the curriculum, the education, and the performance expected by the community, of course. In addition to where are we, you know, our curriculum advisor and professional learning team are now in place. They have their starting action plan, but they're all, that, that they're working on, which is related to our current professional development and our current curriculum. But now they're starting to transition to finally formally working together as a district-wide team on developing the 2019-2020 action plan that will be, be brought to the planning team and the board by the end of the year, which was the initial uh, rollout that we would actually have them developing it, not just necessarily the administration on the initial rollout. Also, currently, our culture and wellness team, which is the third part of a four-part team, is being formed, uh, and they are actually being formed right now as we speak, and they will be beginning their work on their sort of entry-level action plan for next year uh, as they develop their team dynamic. In addition, the fourth part of the community engagement team is slated to be formed and begin work roughly around April of this year, uh, and that's in the process. We, we, each year we try to get one up and going and started on group dynamics before the next one. So they're online so that we would have two formal action plans in place by the end of the year and draft initial plans for the other two for the start of the next year as well. And then we'll be in full swing with evaluation and redevelopment over the course of the 2019-20 year. And then current, uh, currently we've been looking at grades 3 through 12 New York State assessment data. And that is something that goes on in our presentations, but it's also something that we'll show you tonight. Interesting about the data is, if you look at it, count are also the red is our testing refusal percentage, because that is important to know over the past couple of years. Uh, this is the 2016-17 state assessments, and what you're looking at is how Horsehead's percentage of proficiency at level three and four uh, in this count compares to GSP BOCES, as well as our counterparts three and four in New York State. Uh, there's actually pretty good news as it relates to the GSP BOCES. Pretty much well, our lowest, we're above all of GSP BOCES, and the minimum that we're above is plus 5%. And that is roughly at our grade five area, right up here. 
And then what happens is, if you can look, you can sort of see the data as, okay, the individuals that refused, we already know a lot of those individuals would actually take our percentages and our assumption is, and our projection is, it's racist because a lot of the students that are refusing at this point are some of our best students as well. So that's something that we're going to have to work on and it's required by the state. Uh, as well as going to New York State, we have a couple areas that we need to sort of focus and target in. One of those areas that is, is stagnant in growth, but still, these are one point of measurements is grade five math over the New York State grade four, and then at grade five ELA, there's some decrease over grade three and four versus New York State, as well as down with grade seven ELA. But that's one of the reasons why we chose ELA as one of our strongest viewpoints to start with in our curriculum. So that's the 17, 18, but you also have to compare this against, I mean, 16, 17. You also have to compare it against 17, 18. The hard part is I can't put both up here, but remember, when you're comparing 16, 17 to 17, 18, you cannot compare grade three L ELA to grade three L ELA each year. You have to actually step up because we work in COPA. So on grade 16, 17, if you notice at the top, grade three math, three, five, three through four is at 57%. When you go to grade three math at the top of 17, 18, those numbers have no potential correlation because it's not the same student. So you actually have to drop down to the 59% for grade four, because that would be the same student. So grade three was 57, grade four for the same cohort group is 59. So you do see some increase in the score. Now, does that mean that the tests are the same or that you can draw all inference from it? No, but it helps you give you a check and balance on the fact of whether or not there is progress being made once the tests are aligned. And these, this is the first generation of the tests that were developed by New York State teachers. So that's something that we want to watch as we look at data over the time. So I have that and, and broken down. I will include sort of the, the differences uh, as much as possible so that you can compare and ask questions. But as you can see, even from one year to the other, grade three math, 6.8% uh, was the test refusal. Well, grade four math, 6.3% was the test refusal. That shows that some of our test refusals are starting to lock down. Where we have the biggest problem, the biggest trend, is mostly in that fourth to fifth grade transition, and that sixth to seventh grade transition. And in ELA, we have a lot of opt-outs. Our highest numbers are at the eighth grade. Once they get to the high school, the opt-outs go away because it's a requirement that you must pass in the New York State region. Uh, we're waiting to see what happens with within the government framework uh, with the state assessment. So as you look at the high school, the January 2017 regents, you have each with the passing percentage and the mastery. What happens is when you compare that, uh, you have the graduation rate at the bottom at 85%. Uh, the state average is 81%. When you go to January 2018, that state average is still at 81% at the five year, and the district went from 85 to 89%. Basically, if a student stays with us, we will get them to graduation. Now, we still need to work on these numbers because our four year graduation rate at 80, 85 and 86% is not necessarily where the state wants us to be. We want to try to get our percentages always above 90% and then make sure that the 10% that are not there stay with us so that we can bring about success uh, through instructional supports over the next year or so. The state will keep track of this on a four-year, a five-year, and a six-year rate. So next year, we will look at 2017 and see, did that 89% break for that? You want that close to 100 by six years. So as you can see, we have some work to do. As it goes to the regents exam, one of the areas that is a major concern for the district we were at 92, 93% total population of passing the English regions three years ago, and each year is a different class, so you have to be careful with your inference. But last, uh, in 2017, we went to 85, we have 54% mastery. This past year, 
we have 79 percent passing rate with 49 percent mastery. The high school is working on their English uh, proficiency rates and their curriculum, and we're looking for the building administration along with the curriculum department to immediately address this. And that is the work over the course of the K 12 PLA curriculum that we're working on too. In general, as you can see in 2018, a lot in the algebra, geometry, and uh, the algebra 2 trigonometry, these are new tests. And so there is some back and forth with the test, but when you really look, especially at algebra 2 last year, the first generation of the new test, we were 84% with 8% mastery. There was a major shift last year, and again, it takes time, but they went to 94% passing, with, and they doubled their mastery. It will be interesting this year to see those that test because it will be its third generation, and you start to see how the testing dynamics go with the state and how they bring about the psychometrics of each examination they put out because there's years where it's a harder test and there's years that it's an easier test, and they've got to find where the balance is, and that's what the state is going on. So you have to be very careful when you look at these numbers because it's not the same student taking the test. It's Primarily a new cohort each year. So, yeah. so, using that analogy, if you looked at the grade 8 math scores for 16 17, they were terrible across mm -hmm. the region. Mm -hmm. And so you can, you can say our opt out numbers were high, you know, it swung it, but across the region they were horrible. Yep. Yet, if you assume those students then took either Algebra 1 or Geometry in January or June, the scores are great. Right. So, what? It That's, was a terrible task. Right now, what okay. happens is, and, and Tony, you're, you're welcome to step in as well, but right now what happens is you can only use the information to help inform you. You can't make it as a corollary prediction of something. Uh, just because the two are not necessarily directly aligned. The regents are just going through what was the old Common Core standard, now the Next Gen standard. And the other tests have already been through that six, seven years, and they're starting to see some changes because we've had three iterations of what the standard is supposed to be. So you would think it would be an indicator of preparedness. Preparedness to take it. And then you have different efforts because we can see how a child changes from grade level to grade level to grade level and track them. But that grade level from third all the way, say in English, from third all the way to an English 11 region doesn't mean that if they were very strong here, they're going to be very strong here because they have eight generations of tests. Now, we want to prepare them, hopefully not for the minimal basic basis of the test, but the maximum basis of the test. So that if they run into the hardest test, they're prepared for it, but if they run into the uh, more easier version of the test, they should be very well prepared for it. So what happens is we have to start working with our staff so they see and start producing gap analysis and understanding where some maybe our issues are within the curriculum. It doesn't mean anyone's bad. It just means maybe we missed something that year. But we don't necessarily do that. I mean, as I talked to the English teachers, that's where they said, you know, this is good. We've done some of this, but we haven't really done this. We talk about it, we get the data, but we don't follow it through. And that's one of the things we're going to be working with our administration because they need to be leading that through. Any yes, please. Just to say, um, one thing to note is that in grade assessments, the timing of them is less instructional time to cover the same standard set that you might see in the high school that full time because the exams are not given in June. Those three grade assessments are given earlier, so there's less instructional time to meet the state standards and which those, those tests are based on. Secondly, it's, there's, there's something that's going on because you're, you extrapolate your 8th grade ELA to 11th grade, you should only have 50%. Proficiency rate in 11th grade English, but obviously the numbers are, are higher than that. So there had to be some continuity there in between here. Something is not right. Something's not right. Something's. And, and I think that is one of the reasons why you really have to be careful about just using test scores as a value metric, especially if you can't connect everything from start to up here is probably one of the, the matrix that we want to look for our commencement level. Basically what happens is uh, with college entrance exam, pretty much research has shown the ACT is more about what a student who's taking the individual exam 
currently possesses his knowledge, and the SATs are more about the student's potential knowledge. Uh, and what happens is in the SAT scores across the bottom, you can see a consistent high. We're above the national average in everything. But that's for each individual cohort, because each individual cohort is a different set of students. If you notice on the ACT, our, our knowledge base, we're actually increasing from 15 to 16, 16 and 17, but in 17, 16, 17, and 17, 18, there is definitely a difference between those classes, because except for science, every score is below the state average. But yet, the past two years before, every score was above the state average. But that's about the specific goal. So how come we're looking for 15, 16 national average, but then 16, 17, 18? I think that's a typo. Sorry about that. Right, so it should be national average? Yes, national average. <laughs> it happened. We we good on it. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's fun. Um, yeah. Uh, so with that, where are we? Some of the community partnerships. You all know we are very active with our community. We're the, we're hoping with the community engagement that's going to bring even more opportunities for the kids. I had a wonderful opportunity at the historical society. That was a new opportunity last night. Uh, honestly, I've never been there. It was a. I had a wonderful time there. Can't wait to take my son there. But I never knew. That, that was the original Shimon Canal thing. I never knew all the information was in it, but it's through these partnerships that our kids get those exposures. So I won't spend a lot of time, uh, but there's, there's huge uh, relationships with our town, our uh, organizations, our connections with our local companies. Our, and the biggest thing is whether it's elementary all the way up to high school, the Career Development Council's ability to work with us and find ways. To make those connections is really going to be a great advantage on our community engagement. In addition, you know, it, the bottom line says it all. Horses, character shine through and through many activities. We had some bad weather this year that hasn't helped us with holidays uh, as well as made different days. But you know what? Our community keeps coming back and back for each other, and our students do as well. And it really shows because you can see the community, the businesses. The organizations reaching out and working together. So, with that, what's coming? What's ahead? Well, we need to continue our district wide new pre K curriculum cycle. Uh, ELA is far from being over, but we have to get each one moving forward on the cycle. Uh, we are in the development of the district's 2019 20 action plan for curriculum advisory. Professional development, they will set those plans, and like I said, cultural wellness and community engagement will start dabbling in theirs to try to get one successful item for the next year, and then fully by the end of the 2020 year, we will have our staff, our administration, our board, our community working on what is our focus going forward. And with that focus going forward, we can't forget our academics, which is the use of data to evaluate district academic programs. Sort of like what we were talking about, looking at critical focus areas like we had data identified, say whether it's ELA in the fifth and sixth grade, why the transition area, whether it's the ELA in the high school area, or maybe global global studies in the high school. They actually had a huge change this past year, and global is one of the more difficult exams that they broke the 80% mark. I think they're at 84% success rate with a high master, which was a good thing that the department could try to. But we also, as a district, need to start making sure that, as in the past, we have an establishment of expect expectations for the future, 3 through 12 New York State assessments. More specifically, the district would like to proficiently rate on all state assessments to be 5 to 10 percent higher than that of the state and or regional average. We're close in some of that, but that shouldn't be the settling point. When the proficiency rates are already above the state and regional averages by that 5 or 10 percent, Basically, we want to always ever keep improving. So if the prior year's proficiency rate is at 79% or lower, we want people to strive for an additional 5% because we're already 10% above. We need to always shoot that that is our bar. If we hit 4%, that's 4% better. But if we're going backwards, we've got to understand why, and we've got to make sure that we make the adjustments more flexible from year to year. If the prior year's proficiency is 80 to 89, we, we don't necessarily want that five. The higher it gets, the harder it is to get the percentages, but you still strive. So 3% is where our desired target is, or greater. Just like if you're at 90 and above, you're where you want to be, but you always want to try to improve. Our perfection is that 100%. So we 
want to start making sure our action plan, our site level plan, start to understand that these are targeted areas that we need to look at, especially if we have an assessment area or a commencement exam that is below the state and regional <coughs> Any questions, or how does everybody feel about that? Because that's the first time we're starting to put numbers to the metric for us. So we'll keep working on this. I've, I'm with, I've already talked to the HDA just so it isn't a surprise to them. They knew about that. They understand that. They also want to tie it back to the former strategic plan, which has that as a premise, which I think is a good thing because we need that. What's coming also, well, we have some starting turnover to teacher shortage, so recruitment of new staff in the needed areas. Uh, and one of the biggest things is hiring season is just around the corner. Uh, we are already going to start hiring because even with the budget, we know we have at least three English positions. We have one phys ed position, and these are positions that are needed for the next year, so why are we waiting to even start developing our candidate pool? Uh, it's something I knew. Director is looking forward to it. Hopefully, take her away from all the other things that she's been doing so far. And she's had a wonderful start here, and we couldn't be more appreciative that, of the work that she's doing. So, uh, the other part is on the business side, which you're going to hear very soon, but we need to continue. And, and uh, our fiscal planning, our transparency, and our responsibility to our community when we are talking about the finances of the district. You've seen this before, it hasn't been updated because we haven't gotten the numbers yet. We're hoping to get them next month. But already, just over 15, 16, 16, 17, and we think it will continue in 17, 18, we spend on average $7,000 almost total expenditure less than every district that's similar in New York State that matches the horse head. That's an outstanding number. Now, when you look at all districts, not compared to just horses, but all upstate all upstate districts, which is a 431, horse is the 17th least expensive district per pupil in all of upstate New York. And if you really think about it, there's seven, I think there's 697 school districts in New York, New York State. The ones that aren't represented by upstate are all more expensive than that number. So if you look at it, that number can be extrapolated into we are roughly the 17th cheapest school district per, per pupil expenditure in all of New York State with the results that you're getting. So that's something that we've, we've been trying to emphasize and now we're actually being recognized for. What else is coming? Well, this summer is going to be very difficult. We have already told Bosi we do not have summer school for middle school here, but we may be able to take summer cohesion. Mike's working that out. Uh, but the summer capital project, and when they get to the full swing, is going to be potentially difficult because we're just going to have to say no because we've got to get so much work done in a short amount of time. In addition, we are moving forward with the Sing Sing Road. We're finalizing budget and finalizing who has to pay for what. That Sing Sing Road should also be uh, potentially possibly starting construction or at least demolition as early as April and then taking the summer once school's out. The, uh, address it because it needs a 30 day cure time once they uh, turn up the road. Uh, so be aware of that. And then here's the thing we have done this project in a, one of the shortest times possible for the size of the project that we're currently working on. That it usually takes two to three years to even get ready for a project. We've got to get ahead because we can't do this with a second project. As we know, there's probably two or three potential projects down the road, but we have to start. Potentially talking about a phase two capital construction that we can build when this project is starting to subside. We just can't wait until that time to start talking about it. So we have to start having some discussions about what happens. So currently, we're building our future now, this is why capital project level one is almost done. We're getting ready to try to close out. This is why capital project is currently ongoing. You're seeing all the work on the schools right now. High school renovations, the waiting state approval, we got approval. Uh, just on that they reviewed the mechanical, so we're almost there. We're trying to speed them up. They had some health issues, but that should be any any time now in the next couple of weeks, we're hoping. And then the middle school, intermediate school, we're in the design phase, and we're currently in estimation for the first round. So we're getting close to wrapping up a lot of the design on this that we're getting into the process and actual application of each of the projects. So at, at 
as we start to wrap that up, we have to look at the next project of continuing to build our future, which is the District Wide Capital Project Phase 2. The areas to be addressed, that just hypothetically in that larger picture, is now the elementary school renovations. We did the outside the envelope, we've got to look at the inside. We have to look at our district. What do we want our elementary schools to be? That's going to take a little bit of time to talk about. The high school south wing would have to be uh, the next part of the renovation because we have two gyms and what happens is we wanted to try to make sure to get our educational spaces in one area of the building. That's what we started. That would be a follow-up to it. As well as we have more high school classrooms that we won't be able to do in, in the first project that we're also going to have to update. The middle school and intermediate school, we're going to have to address more, more classrooms there if we're addressing the lunchroom and the uh, uh, science, art, and tech rooms right now. So we will have to do some updates there, as well as update our outdoor spaces and traffic flow across the district. Just so you have a sense of some of the timeline, we can't start construction until around 2022, 2023, 2024. So if you use that work back to get state at approval to be able to hit some of those windows, we really have to make sure we have an affirmation vote somewhere around fall of 2020 or spring of 2021. And then even to get ready for a vote, it took us six months. We're trying to get six to eight months so that we can have the community dialogue private concept because we have to deal with this discussion. So that's sort of laying out some of the things that we have to think about in the future, but it's are also issues that we've already talked about in the past. Overall, the district is moving forward uh, what we believe my administrative team uh, in our discussions in a, in a positive direction. I think you'll see a little bit of that tonight, but like it always makes you worry. Uh, much has been accomplished, uh, but there's more work to be done in certain educational and operational areas, as you can see from just some of the presentation, as well as some of you tours throughout the district. And then the big thing is we will utilize our newly developed curriculum that has been developed in conjunction with collaboration with the teacher, as well as our action plan that is also being developed in collaboration with our uh, instructional staff and our community to focus work in order to reach our academic expectations, which is trying to strive for that 90 or above, or at least be marching towards that goal. Uh, so in general, the district moving forward, I think we've got a, a good presentation coming up on the budget tonight, even though how can you ever say that the presentation is good on budget? It's just we have to go through it. So questions on this part. Hopefully okay, they did that in 25 minutes. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I don't have a question, just a comment. Um, sure. I think I, I know this takes a lot of work to put together and I think this is a great summary of, of what's happened in the past <laughs> year and the accomplishments that the, that the district has had. So thank you for summarizing that and that together it was nice. We have a lot more to go, and uh, other questions? Other than that, I'm going to turn it over to a wonderful person <laughs> who has to put up with me, Miss <laughs> Katie Bazette. <Bizet. laughs> So tonight is going to give you a quick rundown of uh, what was on the governor's proposal, what the tax cap is looking like, uh, and where our budget stands, and then we'll hear from the transportation department. So uh, the governor gave his proposal a few weeks ago. Um, in that, he is proposing to increase uh, the overall state aid uh, by $956 million, or 3.58%, um, increasing that to $27.7 billion. Of that, foundation aid is up to 18.1 billion, which is 338 million over last year. Uh, but recall, they are lumping that community schools money in that foundation aid figure. Uh, that's up to 250 million dollars this year, which we don't participate in. Um, a couple of interesting points in the governor's proposal this year. Um, we mentioned before that uh, the division of budget has come up with a uh, a school of Transparency Equity report that schools will have to uh, report in a staggering schedule. Last year, um, 76 and 2018 had to report. It was school districts that received 50% or more of their budget from state aid. So we did not participate in 18. Um, we will have to in 19. But part of this proposal is uh, proposing a law that if 
your equity plan is showing that you are not equitably funding the four schools in your district, you'll have to submit a, a, a school spending plan to the state for approval. Your budget to make sure those four schools are getting the money uh, that, that's owed to them. So they found with those 76 schools when they submitted their budget that uh, many of them weren't allocating more money to those poor schools and the whole methodology that the government had behind this allocation of school funds to give it to the poor district, it should trickle to the poor schools. And this report is showing that that's not happening, so they're trying to uh, put some laws in the place to make sure that we're using those poor schools with the money that's equal in there. So we're, we're doing 19 to submit this plan. Uh, the business office is working on this now. It's a rather onerous report, um, and the state is not exactly providing the best guidance at this time. So we're working on it now. Uh, it's a proactive approach. If there's any modifications we could make during the next <coughs> budget cycle to prevent any uh, surprises later, that's what we're trying to do. So we'll keep you updated on that. Uh, secondly, he is proposing a change to uh, some state aid categories effective in the 2021 school year, where a lot of our expense driven aids that are calculated separately based on what we actually spend for transportation and both seats. He's proposing a, a new cluster type aid that's no longer driven based on what you spent, but on some formula that has to be really predetermined, but will have a cap based on enrollment and inflation. Um, we don't anticipate that necessarily being the best thing for schools, um, so we're hoping um, to add a speaker to those seats out there and you know, explore, this, explore this option and hopefully have some resolution will be reached. So, more to come then, again, I ask until 2021. <clears throat> this is just a uh, year over year history of where our foundation aid increases have been. Uh, we are a little lower than we were in the 18 19 year. Um, but we probably will just the first pitch of the budget is going to go up a little or some at some point um, once we get the final budget. Uh, but last year, just for a point of reference, um, when we received the 18 19 government proposal, that was also a $338 million increase. So we're on par with where it was last year. So we'll see where we land. This is where our aid is looking at currently for 1920. We did receive $182,000 increase in foundation aid. Uh, the, the main point of um, our aid increase was in our building aid. We are on track to close out uh, the phase one that was in uh, the Conlon Series and Bus Garage and the District Wide Tech Project in the Allen Series uh, by the end of the 2019 calendar year which means we'll receive our first aid payment on those projects in 1920, which is the timing we attended because that's when our first full debt payment is due on the first borrowing that we did. So overall, right now, we have a, a little over 4% increase in our savings. Question. The, the governor's proposal column that utilizing the, the proposal of the aid being tied to District enrollment and inflation formula as opposed to actual expenditures. No. What you've used there for projections. Yeah, so that his proposal for enrollment and inflation isn't enacted until 2020. Oh, okay. Yeah, so this is still running based on um, <coughs> actual budget. Okay. Uh, what's our percentage of increase without? Um, I don't have that off the top of my head. So I can get that for you and send it out. So we go through this information each year, it's just an overview of the tax cap. Um, limited to the 2% of our greatest inflation, we're still at our 2% this year. Um, an interesting item of note this year that you'll see will have an impact on our calculation is that our tax rate growth factor that's set by the state is at 1.0288. Uh, a big jump from last year, 4.0095. Um, okay, if I can just answer Doug's question. Doug, I just did a rough calculation. It's somewhere a little bit under 2% or just a little bit over 2% okay. without the building. Okay. 
Okay, so here is the first half of the calculation. Um, we have 1890 and the first record for last year, compared to 1920. So we start with a 1920, this here, that's what we logged last year for current year for 1890. That's when we applied that new uh, updated growth factor of 1.288, which bumps us up to a little over 38 million. We add back our pilots that we calculated on the calculation last year, so we're adding back to 949. You recall last year we used a portion of our debt service fund to zero out the capital exclusion, so that capital exclusion here is for that adjustment. So with those factors so far, our adjusted lending is at 39.4 million. By the 2%, we're at 40.1. Our pilots are down here. We did have some um, age out of their 15 years. We did pick up a few to offset that, but we're 922,000 per pilot. We track that out from the calculation because we're collecting that money to pilots, not to taxes, and we're at 39.2. Our capital exclusion this year, uh, that's basically any of our capital expenditures plus any aid on those expenditures, so our, our bus debt, our building debt, and that million dollar transfer to capital, plus any state aid we're expecting, any transportation aid on capital expenditures related to transportation. Once you net those two out, we have a capital uh, exclusion of 1.1 million uh, that we can add back into the levy to the taxes on, which brings us up to 40.3, um, 3 million over last year, or 8.06. We will continue to talk about this in the course of the, of the budget development. I understand that's a high number, uh, so we'll have to, it'll be you know, modified here and there throughout, but it'll stay roughly in that range, so we'll have to talk flexibly you know, what, what we want to do. This is a summary of our revenues compared to last year. Um, the items in yellow are the items still to be determined. As we don't know for 1920 the tax rate or the tax amount is flat compared to 1819 until we start talking about what we want that lens to look like. Uh, so with uh, just the revenue that we know, uh, we'll assume the payment on taxes for 75.2 in, in revenue at this point. Expenditures were up from 77 million to 8.7, primarily due to the areas of salary and um, our debt service. As I said before, we have uh, picked up our first full debt payments on the, the first bar we got for the capital project. So this is where we started budget every year. We take the expenditures, as we know, when we roll the budget. Offset by any revenues that, that we, we know for now, not including <coughs> any tax levy increase, um, any potential additional pay day uh, from balance or things like that. So, right now we're at a gap of 5.4 million. Again, not with reserves, not with fund balance or things like that. Um, so, as we do each year, I will build the budget in front of you. I'll go through any budget reductions that we look at over the Any questions so far before I turn it over to Pete? Just real quick before Pete does. Yeah. So go back, we go back to slide. So just kind of as keep in expenditures to me, contracts and everything that we currently have. About three point seven million dollar increase in expenditures to keep up with all that. And then go back to the prior slide and
You're actually making what I was going to come up with. You look at right now. Remember when we started, we've been pretty much consistent about 6.2 to start to 5.9 million. Notice positively, we're starting about 5.4 million. So we've been effectively making some changes to bring that down. But we use that fund balance, the reserves of about 2.8, 2.9 million. Imagine, this is simplistic speaking, and, and I can tell you we're not going up that number. I mean, but if you close your budget gap, remember, you've got to always make sure the community understands. This is what the governor did when he put in the tax cap. This is what the governor is saying we should be doing to keep our budget going forward. Because this is a 50% number. Now, if you look at our, our budget gap, about 5.4 million. If we, if we were able to do this, we're raising Three billion dollars. What's our new gap? Two point four. We're spending two point nine to three point one. We just lowered our amount. Now that's without doing anything. That's easy budgeting out there. But that's what people get confused with so much is that's the two percent number. Two percent. But in order, and this is what I've been saying over the years. We have to, tr I mean, and I don't mean this just because that number is there, but I've said it every year. We have to try to maintain whatever that maximum allowable. Otherwise, you're digging a bigger hole eventually over time because you won't be able to keep up. Now, we have to try to balance. Is there, are there reductions? Are there savings? Are there other things? And yes, we do have some tools. So I, honestly, we, both Katie and I were like, this isn't as bad as we've had to go through. So we have some tools. but. I want you to keep that in mind because we don't know what the tax, remember this is the percent, we don't know what the tax rate would be. There are years in our past where the tax levy was this, but the rate was 1%, 17 cents to raise that much money. That's, remember how we did that last year? So keep that in mind as we, as we go throughout the process because like last year, we always, I, I always forget when I know it comes to the shop. Remember, we're at 5.4. We're going to hit in a couple minutes. You're going to see a couple of ads or requests, and it's going to grow over time. And then we got to bring it back down. But over that same time, Albany's going to be doing its sort of accordion with the budget. And the one thing that's got me really worried is the governor saying we're two point three billion dollars short because of Trump's tax cut. That's his talking point. Because remember, last year's budget was one hundred fifty-four billion dollars. His budget is only supposed to go up by two percent, which is three billion dollars. His budget proposed this year is 174 billion. That's not two percent, but he's saying two percent. So we've got to be very willing to be active at the end because I think those our elected constituents, I hate to say it, our elected constituents have no power. But they do have collaboration with somebody that does in big open. And we're going to have to work to try to massage some of that. I'm going to Albany this weekend to start some of that process. Because I don't believe that the legislature and the Senate is just going to roll over on education because they're all of the same heart. They have been very good, strong supporters, and their numbers are above it. But just keep all of this, we'll keep reminding throughout that people hear this because we put this on uh, the taping so that people understand. That's not what we're trying to propose. It's just we have to give the transparency and the light of day of everything that we're doing so that people know what's happening. So I appreciate your time and your questions. Thank you for bringing that up, Doug. It, it's a good analogy. We're pretty close with the just basic tool, but we can do better. Thank you. So, apparently, I'm the guy asking for the extras. <laughs> <laughs> just, just the first guy. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> they're up first. So, I'm not alone. <laughs> okay, so transportation department overview. So, as we go through some of these numbers, I, I, I will hopefully be able to describe to you some of the decisions that we made last year, uh, like the employee <coughs> monitor, that type of thing, and then updating to what's been going on an hour ago. So, um, here's the overview. The two biggest things I think you look at there. Salaries, basically that's contractual issues. We'll look at that at the next slide. 
And you want to know, obviously, is one that we can't control. Uh, we're not where we were there several years ago. We're up to four dollars in some sense. We're really, really grateful. But that looks like uh, projecting what we're using as fuel cost today. This is what we will need to continue to do next year. So to go up, to go down. You guys know what it's like. We we are our own vehicles. So that's what we got to do. We're looking at many thousands and thousands of gallons that we use. I do want to make a side comment though. It's very nice. On these really, really cold days that we've had, um, uh, our equipment service manager, Jason Johnson, and I have been looking at some of the different options. We've been getting some of our buses that we ask them. The only buses that gave us absolutely no trouble were all our gasoline buses on those really, really cold days. So we're looking at that as a continued option as we go along. We didn't buy all gasoline buses, but we really want to check it out as it's a, that's not a new technology to school buses. They've been using it for all of the ones for years and years, but it's been actually very nice. So that one is really good on that. Um, parts and supplies, uh, other operating costs, most of those. So the two biggest increases there are the uh, salaries and the All right, so moving on to uh, what since it is broken down to for salary. Um, again, that's, it's mostly contractual. Uh, the one that I want to point out the most, if you go down to the dispatcher safety examiner monitor, so that's the uh, and remember that we have now a, and that, that's not, that's just what we're reminded of. We have a floating monitor now. So I kind of want to give you a quick report on that. Uh, first of all, thank you. Um, so I sat down with her today and said, so I'm going before the board in the community. How would you like to describe what you've been able to accomplish? And, and I gave her some time. She got back to me. And she said that um, there's, I just had to make a list of pros and cons. So her pros are, are the things that she was able to accomplish mostly in helping drivers to know what to do when they're on the bus and get certain kids. So she ends up being more of a, we didn't know exactly how it would work, right? One floating person. Uh, so she's kind of an on-the-job training person that's been phenomenal. So the drivers might be training in a classroom, but when they have somebody that's helping them right there, it, it's, it's making a difference. So that's helped us a lot. Uh, the only place that she, and that's on her con list is that there are some children that it doesn't matter if you're not looking at them right there, then it doesn't matter if she pulls through their bus. Somebody needs, needs to be there to watch them all that. And you know that's the plan all works with kids. And we're finding more and more needs, no, no question about that. But I want you to, I want to thank you for that. For that, that's a real thing. Yes, we'll talk about asking some more in a couple minutes. All right, moving, <laughs> to, the, moving to the next slide. Uh, transportation aid. Uh, it's just good to keep that in mind. All of the things that we do have as costs. Uh, that this is what we have for the, the twenty, the nineteen twenty year projected is seventy four point two. So that is slightly better than what we had. Uh, again, let's see what the governor is going to, uh, to do in the next couple of years. I don't. Think that's kind of a, but we all have a little bit of concern about that, so let's look at that. Bus purchase history. So we show this one to you every year so you can see the increased cost of these things. Uh, now, last year, we did uh, 1.3, and uh, we got the eight buses. We bought five that were diesel, and uh, let's see, wait a minute, this, this, this year was four and four? Four and four, okay, so we did four diesel and four gasoline, and we just love it. We love the gas, but we love the diesel buses too. So this is just a quick reminder of, of the fact that we get quality buses here. We don't just buy the basic. We do we do have some extras, absolutely, uh, and some of the extras we feel are necessary. I'll give you some examples: um, air ride seats. Some of those we have a lot of country roads out there, and that saves on the driver's back, which we hope saves on some medical expenses. Yeah, overall, uh, we have. Uh, Windows, we have new safety things all, all the time. The newest safety one that Jason uh, found that we just love is, and maybe you've seen on the brand buses, there are brand new strobe red lights in the grill and on the rear back of the bus, in addition to the flashing light. Like and the nice thing about it is it's all at eye level, so as the vehicles come up, they see it at eye level, not up above. And that seems to help. Uh, who knows what statistics there are to prove that. But it does help people to see us. And whenever they see us, one thing that they always say to the officer is, 
I didn't see that bus. They always say that. You know. Why? The only studies that they figured out is it's, a, it's an integral part of society, that big old yellow bus, and so they really don't. There's not paying attention to it. Which is scary when it comes to all of the passing of the red and the Remember, that's 50,000 in your state a day. 50,000 a day. Okay, I digress. All right, moving on. So that's our purchase history. We'll talk about what we'd like to do for this coming year as well. So here's the two things that I'll refer to. Let me, let me go first with the, the repeater system. So we have a need for an upgrade on the system that we have for our right now. Now, one thing that's nice, the repeater that we have right now, uh, we own the territory up on Moss Hill. So we own our own repeater. We don't have to rent it like most of the school districts have to do, which is great. But it's one repeater, and that covers our whole system. Everybody is moving to out of analog into the digital system. And so eventually, very soon, we're going to have to do that. We have a need to upgrade. So the talk was do we need to upgrade just exactly what we have? Or do we want to upgrade the security system for the whole school district? So here's what this includes, not just school buses. This includes the system that allows the school personnel in each school to also communicate with everybody on the buses. Go ahead, Doug. Okay. Well, it's like the same thing. Well, yes, yes. What's a repeater? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So, uh, it is the mechanism by which the signal goes from us there and then gets spread out. Okay. Or radio. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's part of the radio system. So, um, boy, I'm not explaining this good. So, let's just say that you have your radio on your bus and your microphone, you talk to the microphone. The signal goes through the repeater and the repeater sends that out all over. All right. So, it's, it's a way, it's like an array for the signal. And we've had an analog, analog signal. Now, the digital, we have lots of areas where it's sketchy at best, and they can't reach it. Uh, the digital will help us with that, number one. And when we have emergency situations and we're looking for kids, to us, that's really, really important. That's, that's a big deal. So when we can upgrade to the digital, that's great. <laughs> what you're going to do, though, with this, is they're going to put a repeater in every one of our schools, number one. So what that allows us is the schools will have the ability to contact the buses, the schools will have the ability to contact each school, and then they can get on different channels for every facilities individual that has a microphone on them or a special radio on them. And so the whole system throughout the whole district is going to be now one unified uh, communication system, which is huge. But it's also something that a lot of schools have that we just never even look at. We're kind of overdue with at least looking at it and, and looking at the the benefits that we have. And the reason we're looking at it now is because if we already have to do an upgrade, we want to upgrade the whole system and add this safety feature to our to our system. Pete, if I can add please. Part of the part of the repeater system by going to digital, uh, what happens is you're getting a federal license for it as well. And that federal license can be hooked up to other municipalities repeaters. And basically, we could be here at home, have a bus in Binghamton, and we can communicate as clearly as well by the radio system. That all has to be worked into it, but that could be the same thing that if I have four elementary schools, uh, intermediate school, middle school, and the high school, and they have their own communication and safety and security plans that are on digital radios, say they're 10 channel Motorola's, one, one channel could always be transportation. So they could actually, from any place, communicate with any of our buses, not only in our district, but also traveling out. They could even, if they live within the confines of that repeater, even take that radio home if they needed to as an emergency button. If we had an emergency action here where it shuts down, <coughs> those become our only real source of internal communication, because as we know, cell phones and cell towers will become flooded. This would be a federally licensed channel for only our use and only we could access it, except for police and security that have the ability to override. Does that help? That's beautiful, absolutely. And that is where our biggest question is, what's our backup right now? <coughs> Cell phones are our backup if anything happens to our line. And as soon as dark comes, dry out, we don't need that as much. So this is a great security. 
Any questions on that? Is that estimate of $150,000 for the repeater system include whatever cost there would be for then the radio units themselves? To, assuming you would need new equipment to, to operate on the digital repeater as opposed to any existing analog equipment. Absolutely. You know what? Jason, maybe you can answer that question a little bit better than I can as far as what's included completely. So, <clears throat> everything is included. So basically, as Pete said, um, to go from an analog system, which we have, think of it as like a, your satellite for a TV. So, dish network, direct network, or direct TV. Basically, you have a, a satellite, a higher powered satellite that's sending digital waves. Yep. So, you're going to do that. But in order us, for us to uh, meet that standard, we do have to change some of the radios. Some of the radios that we purchased in the last couple of years, we had a feeling it was going to come. Um, Schmoke County has switched over to digital. They have done a lot of uh, changing their, uh, the radios out. So we had an option to change some of our radios out in the district to be prepared for this. Um, it wasn't a much of an expense at the time, but to get everything on the same wavelength um, and make sure that everyone can communicate with everyone, this is what we would have to do. But like Pete said, we would be able to communicate with the schools. They would have their own line, just like the channel one, two, three, and four, they can use their own channels. But in an emergency situation, as Dr. Douglas said, we would be able to communicate with everyone in an emergency situation. Uh, but yes, we would have to replace um, our repeater that we own that is up on Moss Hill. That is an analog system. We would have to replace that. Um, and then every radio, and there's a couple things that each school would have to be done as well. Oh, but this this estimate increase covers all that. Yes, yeah, so that estimate is going to be all schools, transportation. <coughs> would it be more if we had uh, already bought in the last several years of buying buses that, that might be an option? Yeah, that's a good yeah. idea. Okay, so we're trying to take that good patient and that one. But additionally, as we put it in, we may find new needs as well. But that study. Any other questions on that one? How old is the current repeater? And we, uh, what's the useful life of these things? That, you know? We've had the repeater that we've had on Moss Hill for probably around 20 years. Um, we have done, I do maintenance on that every year. I have a company come out of Rochester. I've had other companies, but uh, if they usually don't hold up to their end, we will switch to somebody else. So I have got a company now in Rochester that's coming out. They do an annual service every year. We install backup batteries, which we've never had in, the, in countless years. We now have a battery backup to allow us to move those power on Moss Hill with a power outage. We were not able to use our radios. With a battery backup that we have now, we are able to use another channel to coexist with other buses. So it, the system is getting very outdated. So we're hoping for another 20 years, if that answers the other half of your question. Yeah, no, I, I just. You know, it's 20 years old and it's breaking down. That's all. Asking. Well, I don't. I don't want to. I, I don't want to speak out of turn, but we don't have stuff that breaks down very often. We have. We take very good care of what we have. But there comes a time where we want to make sure that we're changing with the times as well, especially with all the things that are going on in the world today. And I think the stuff that we have works. But as he said earlier, there are a lot of places in our area that are highs and lows with the rain. And it just never could reach out to it because you're hitting the mountains and it's just bouncing right over. The digital is going to go a lot further and hit a lot more places than we've ever had. Thank you. Okay. We're trying to think ahead with some of these things. Another example of that is uh, some of the options we have on buses. One of the things that we're doing for this coming year is uh, seatbelt changes. Uh, what's going on in legislation to fight? And we are going back and forth constantly. Do we put seatbelts on those buses? You know, New York State is one of the few of the states that we know that require them, but also does require us to use them. But then if we use them, the argument is, okay, if the child is buckled in the hips and then they come forward, then they can get whiplash, even though that seat is made with extra padding and it's made with a framework so that it will take the shock of the body even back again. So how do you enforce it? Who's going to pay for it? There's, there's so many of those questions. So, so trying to be a little proactive, what some of the uh, other school districts that we're seeing as a trend right now is, as they get new buses, they're just going ahead and they're buying seats with the seatbelts, the three-point seatbelts, and the shoulder strap. So we know the big kids aren't all going to fit in them, um, but you can fit two of the larger kids, one on each side of the seat, and three of the smaller kids. 
with each. So we would pretty much be okay uh, with coverage. And then if we just opened it up to the community to be able to say, listen, we're thinking about your safety. If you feel this is something you'd like to use, you train your children to do that. And then now the community is going to understand that we, we care about their safety and not try to stay ahead of the curve on this one. Any questions on that part? That's, that's an ongoing discussion that nobody ever wins the argument on. Uh, we're trying to just make it so that we can say, this is already here. Are you, are you ready? If your parents want to use it, they can. And just so the board knows, there's currently legislation to mandate it for this year's budget. It's coming. Okay. All right, the last one that I have, uh, one to three additional bus monitors. Uh, so the pros and cons of this that we talked about earlier that uh, Mrs. Beasy uh, has is and that kind of was her point is that we have uh, we have children that just need <coughs> more regular care. It is a, it's a it's a trend that we see with uh, every school district that having the same issues. So uh, what we're thinking is if we can get one to three more, we'll probably have some of them stay on certain buses more than others because of the need. They will still be able to jump, you know, to be a floater if they need to be, but there are certain buses that just need to work that back and uh, to be able to keep control. Uh, we don't have the ability to, like we used to in the past, take a group of, of several buses in the area that's, that are full buses that have behavioral issues regularly and then just say, hey, let's, let's take another bus, bring it in there and split them up more. So the driver who's driving and trying to pay attention to the road doesn't have to spend so much time with behavior, with discipline. But we can't do that. As you all know, finding drivers is just not as easy as it used to be anymore. Uh, right now, we're down to six, uh, and we have, uh, I believe, three that we know of that will probably be retiring by the end of the school year. And so we're training three right now that just started, uh, and that takes a couple of months to get that. And at the, this point right now, we have nobody to do for new ones. So, you can see we got the bus back out with the band, which seems to work. It helps. Um, uh, Mr. Lynch and I had a great conversation. I guess using board members and bus drivers is out. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Seth. He's great. Um, but we do have a, we have a constant need for that. I just want you guys to know that that's, that's where we're at, just like every year school, other school has it. Um, but we're trying to get more, and one of the things that we do is the band. And that um, we're really, really grateful for all of those individuals that we have. And because you notice one of the, the expenses is substitute slash extra pay on that. All of these retired people that still come back and are helping us out. Thank goodness that we have that. So we're really, really grateful for that. Okay, I know I'm spending a lot of time here. I apologize. So our bus replacement is the last one. So this one, we're looking to see, uh, we're seeking eight, 65 passenger buses like we often do. Uh, the last two years, we've gotten uh, two SUVs. We don't need SUVs. The two things that we felt that we needed in addition to that were two small buses. Now, of course, it hasn't done small buses in a long, long, long time. The times are changing. There's no doubt about it. We're, uh, we get more requests for uh, homeless children. Sometimes it, it can last uh, a couple weeks. Sometimes it can last a couple years. Uh, and then you may have to go down to Elmira. Them up. We may have to take some of them back and forth to uh, different hotels in the area. Uh, we have needs that are different, no question about it. Um, and some of these children now are special buses we have to divide up because we have a need for space. We can't pack them in out of their, their needs, and we have to take care of them. So uh, that's the two things that we were looking for in addition to the two buses. Instead of SUVs, uh, those. And they're not that much, they're just slightly more than what the SUV does, to be honest, because they're not very expensive. But we do certainly use them. And I think, yes, any questions for me? I'm ready. Yes, can you talk a little bit about what, the, what has been the process for assigning the, the current, the one current floating monitor, how that on any given day? How it's been determined what buses that should be. I sure can. Yeah, so our student behavior monitor, the one who's in charge of discipline for everybody, uh, she will every day assign her based on 
certain needs, and that's what I mean now, I mean an issue that came up that needs to be addressed. Uh, a driver who's having an especially hard time with the bus, that's the most common one. The driver that's having a very hard time keeping control of that bus. So those drivers, now that gets reported and then looked at and said, okay, well let's assign, you know, we're having a real problem on 842, let's exactly. ride 842. It's, it's a parent call, so that's exactly what happens. The parent will call and just say, hey, look, this and this and this is happening on my bus. And we'll say, okay, we'll get right on that. And, and to be honest, it's usually the same four or five, six buses. You know, and that's why we were asking for a special because um, they just need some more regular people out there to do that. Um, and then, if there's a real, real special need, then I'll assign her. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes we have very confidential issues that come up, and they need special attention. And the fully monitor can be incredibly valuable for us on that, and helping us, and helping the district deal with situations of people. Somebody that's there on the So that's our presentation for tonight. Any questions or things that you uh, would have in regards to transportation or in general direction of what we talked about? Or your initial thoughts on what you just saw in but... Katie has the last of it, the, the last part of our meeting is our future meetings. We'll take as usual, we'll tape everything, put them on uh, the website so the community can uh, follow along as well. Uh, most of our meetings will be here, but at this time, you know, I, I know you know, and I appreciate your comments, Christine. But we really are lucky that we have one person that we can lean on to make sure that we're taken care of, and that's Sue Perico. So thank you for putting on this event. Thank you. Okay, so our next item on the agenda are there any additional questions from the audience relative to the budget presentation? Or any members of the public? Okay, so hearing none, I need a motion to go into executive session. So moved. No action to be taken. So everyone else, thank you for coming this evening. Drive home safely in the rain. Stay warm tomorrow.